is we want to continue today as we're wrapping up the LED series, our leadership, evangelism, discipleship. And we've asked Pastor Keith to head up our discipleship adventure for us and what he's doing. And he it will be sharing today about what that means and what that looks like. And it is good it is good to have Keith and Crystal and the girls home with us and to be here in the future too, right? Yeah. And so we're going to welcome Keith to come on up and to share with us. And it is good to have him back with us. Well, it is good to be home. And... Uh... And you know, when we uh, went on our journey a few, about nine months ago, um, we were blessed to be able to come back to a place that we know loved us, but was allowing us to figure out whatever our next steps were, and we would have never imagined, honest, honestly, I didn't, I didn't imagine that our next steps would actually be here. Um, but we are so grateful and thankful, and uh, we love you. Uh, we are excited to be on this journey in the future, and just can't wait to see what, what God has in store. So, um, Yeah. We are so pumped to be here and walking it with you. Uh, one quick thought before we dive in, and that is in this place, we have a few traditions that we just try to stick to. One of them's communion. If you were here earlier in the service, you participated in that. Another one, uh, a tradition that has a lot of value and, and is very meaningful and is, is a part of who we are is baptism. And with baptism, man, maybe you're here today and you have just started following Jesus, or maybe you've been following Jesus and you've just never been baptized. We want to just strongly encourage you to be a part of that baptismal service. they got a meeting on Wednesday night. You can get more information in the bulletin. You can sign up out at the information center. Um, but man, it, it's one of those special times where we gather together. And the reason we bug you so early to be a part of it is because it, it does matter. And we, uh, man, we want to make it a special day for you and for those you would invite as you proclaim to them, hey, I'm following Jesus and, and I'm not turning back. So if you haven't signed up for that or would like to be baptized, please plan on doing that today and being a part of that meeting on Wednesday. All right, I don't have a good transition, so let's just jump, all right? LED. LED, Leadership Evangelism and Discipleship. And if you've been with us over the past several weeks, uh, you know that this isn't, uh, this isn't a step one, two, three type formula that we're giving you each week. Uh, we don't have the answers from A to Z. What we're laying out in these weeks during this series is more foundational thought. It's giving you the foundation to know where we're going, what we're going to be building upon as we move in, into the future. It's also, if you've been around or been listening online, you know that the three thoughts, leadership, evangelism, and discipleship, they're very fluid. I mean, there's parts of discipleship that you look at and go, okay, okay I, I, I think evangelism fits with that. Or, or when I think of evangelism, I think of leadership. And however it may be, we acknowledge they're interwoven. They're very fluid in how they function together. And the foundational thought that we're going to talk about today is discipleship. And within that thought, we want to just sort of um, get you thinking about this idea of discipleship. That true growth is both knowing and becoming. True growth is both knowing and becoming. When you look at our mission statement, our mission statement is helping people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And I really believe one of the key words in that statement is that word become. Because in that word, in that word lies some tension. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. The tension that exists as we try to live out this true growth. As we try to be a culture of discipleship in this church that you all call home, and what it looks like to become, what it looks like to know, and then we're going to talk about the tension as well. If you got your Bibles, go to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to be diving in there, and we'll, we'll stick, a, for the most part, in, in Colossians, but we may, we may go to a, a couple other places. But Colossians chapter 1, just know that Paul is writing this from prison, and he's writing to encourage a group of people. And they're believers, but they're believers who are being told that Jesus isn't enough. They're believers that are being told, listen, you also need to worship angels. You also need to go to some old of our Jewish traditions and rituals for it really to be enough because Jesus wasn't enough. Well, Paul is going, well, you can't believe that. That's not true. I'm going to remind you who Jesus is and who you are in Christ. And so he writes this letter to this group of people. Now, where we're going to pick up is in this letter, partially, mainly at the beginning of the letter, where he is speaking a lot of encouragement into their lives. But I think you'll see as we dive in, it speaks to this idea 
of true growth being knowing and becoming and living in the tension of the two. We're going to read uh, chapter 1, verse 9. We're going to go all the way to 14, and then we'll go back and look at those verses. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and give, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of life. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's really wordy. That you should feel very churchy after reading that, okay? I mean, that's, that's, everything in there is biblical because it's in there, but it's one of those things you read and you go, oh, what in the world does that mean? So let's, let's try to break it down a little bit. I, I want to go back and point out a few words that matter because I want to remind you in this section of scriptures, we talk about knowing and becoming where God falls into this. Because did you catch that? Go back. Can we go ahead and put verse 9 back up there? Let's, let's look at some of these words again. He's asking God to what? To fill us. That means God is doing something in your life, filling with you the knowledge of his will, giving you this wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. That is a gift of God through the Holy Spirit. He gives us so much more. When you look down in verse 11, what's it talk about? It talks about strengthening. It talks about power. Both of those come from God. It talks about a rescue. It talks about the fact that he is the one that qualifies you. It talks about in, in verse 13 and 14 that he rescues us, that he brings us into the kingdom of his son. And in verse 14, we see that it is God who gives redemption. It is God who forgives. So as we talk about knowing and becoming, I don't want you to forget that it is God who loves you silly. And he did all of those things and promises all of these things for those who follow him. He is going to make it so that you can not only know, but that you can become. Let's break down these verses a little bit, specifically going back to verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Look at these next few words in particular. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, knowing. Then look at the next verse, because it's a comma, it's not a period there. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, becoming. In this verse, he sees speaking to that heart of both knowing and becoming, and that they both matter. But the reality is we know that we have to live in the tension of the two, and that is often where we struggle. That's often where we find ourselves getting stuck, is that we honestly, we don't live in the tension Let's try to understand knowing a little bit more. I want you to turn a page in your Bible if you got it or you see it on the screen. We're just going to go to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at a few other words that he, he speaks in regard uh, to this encouragement that he's giving them, but as well, I think, impacts the idea of us knowing as a follower of Christ and being a disciple. Chapter 2, verse 6, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. If you're taught something, that means you're learning something. If you're learning something, that means you're being given knowledge. You can know it. And overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. Now what I love about the version that we have on the screen, it's the English Standard Version. When it speaks, it, it combines two great metaphors. Where I said lived, when you look at the, the words that are closest to the original language, it actually says walked. And so we have been given this beautiful opportunity to find our identity in Christ, to live through him, but it's also to walk in him. And then these crazy metaphors are right next to each other, walk and rooted. Because when you think of those two words, you don't think of the same image. When you think of walk, that's progression. You're moving forward. When you think of being rooted, you think of standing still. You think of a, a firm foundation type of deal. And yet, and yet, in this letter, Paul is sort of combining those two metaphors. And I, I think we get it. I mean, we can read it and go, okay, he's saying we need to keep growing. 
but we need to have a foundation. And I really believe that part of your foundation, part of what you need to be rooted in, part of what you need to, to have that foundation in is in knowing who it is you're in. If you're in Jesus, do you really know him? And can I tell you, the best way to get to know who he is, the best way to get to know the heart of God and God's character and, and what it means to follow Jesus means you gotta get into this. This is not an optional part of following Jesus. This right here is a real deal. And it opens your heart and your mind to incredible truth that will transform your life through the power of Jesus Christ. But he's given us this incredible resource so that we can know. True growth is both knowing and becoming. Now, what's interesting is he uses those words of walking and rooted. When you think of roots, you think of a tree. Tree roots, for the most part, are underground. And that's where the structure is getting strengthened. We also know that the roots are the place where the tree, it absorbs water and nutrients. It stores it and it distributes it among the trees so the tree can grow. So when you think about getting into the word, when you think about this as your water, as your nutrients, we want to absorb it, we wanna take it in, we wanna know more and more about what it means to follow Jesus, more and more about his character and, and who he is. We want to take that in, we want to absorb it. We wanna store it. We wanna store it in our head, we wanna store it in our heart. We want it to be there and we want to distribute it because we understand that, okay, I've gotta live this out. I need to take all this in so that I can live it out well and, and I can walk in a way that will honor God and, and be, uh, be a blessing to the people around me and honor him. I love in those verses how it speaks to that idea of being rooted, of being rooted in that thing that is foundational to who you are. And when you think of a tree, a tree with strong roots can withstand and actually fights against, I should say, erosion. When a tree has really strong roots, it is less likely that that tree will fall down. When a tree has strong roots, it's less likely the tree will fall down. When your roots are strong, when you are diving into and really truly getting to know the word, really truly getting to know who God is and his character and what he's all about and who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, you're going to be able to stand because circumstances will come. Things in life that you didn't plan on are going to happen. Where are your roots? The fruit of your life will reveal where your roots are. May your roots be found in Christ. And how do you know who, what it is to be in Christ? You know what you were taught because you get into the word. You find it in the word. Not only is tr true growth knowing, but it's also becoming. And as much as I believe getting into God's word is absolutely an essential part of you becoming a, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, I also believe the becoming matters. And you know, sometimes you find something, you go, man, they tell that so well, and in fact, I'm not going to try to tell it because they tell it so much better. And I want you to watch this video clip of a guy named Francis Chan as he speaks to the reality of how important it is to become. Let's watch this clip. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. Right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon says is, uh, you know, you just Simon says pat your head, you know. So okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how, in the church, Jesus says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it; you just have to memorize it. You, 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 you study it, you memorize You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? They memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> you said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> 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 
my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said and talk about how much we know? About it? it's, just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I'd start making disciples. We read earlier those words, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the spirit that gives so that, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing him in every way. The idea of becoming matters. A Michael Hart wrote a book, and it's called The Hundred. And it's called The Hundred, ranking the most influential people in world history. Now, just so you know, you may not agree with his list, and there's aspects of who he is and how he operates that I don't agree with. I, I believe he shows tendencies to be a racist, and just in case you didn't know it, that's wrong. And so, uh, there's parts of his list that I definitely don't agree with, but it's interesting when you look at, at his list. Jesus made the list, but he's number three. Now, I know some of you are curious. You're going, well, who are the top two? Well, number one is Muhammad. Number two is Sir Isaac Newton. But number three, number three was Jesus. And before we get defensive and want to back that up and go, no, Jesus should be number one, I want you to hear the reason why Jesus was number three. Because the reason this guy, this guy's opinion, Michael Hart said it, he goes, the reason that Jesus is number three, because those who operate in his name don't follow what he teaches. Ouch. Those who say they operate in his name don't follow what he teaches. As much as we hate that statement, we know it can be quite true, can't it? And it makes you want to sort of wrestle, and let me help you wrestle with a question. Are, are you letting the truth of God are you letting the truth of scriptures impact your life in such a way that it's altering your life? Or are you changing what you believe so you can live the way you want to? When we look in scripture and look at the word disciple and you take the word disciple and you go to the original language, it gives it one of the meanings that comes into play is the idea of a learner. And I think when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, it wasn't learner in the sense of where we think of in a classroom. They didn't all sit in desk and, and face a chalkboard. They weren't in some uh, Google chat forum. It wasn't a Skype meeting. It wasn't something like that. Now, what did Jesus do? Jesus walked out life with his disciples. They learned by watching what Jesus did and learned to do that. And they learned who Jesus was because they were constantly with him. Jesus was all about inviting them in, but there was transformation and there was change going on. Now, uh, discipleship, discipleship it isn't just some random behavior that you do. It should be at our core. It should be at our core, and it's part of who we are because we don't just want to know something in our head. We don't just want to know something in our head and because when we do that, I don't think we're doing what Jesus had in mind. What Jesus had in mind, I really believe, was living in that tension of both knowing and becoming. Some of us, or probably many of us in this room, we have the intellectual knowledge of what the Bible says, what Jesus would even say about forgiveness, about loving one another, about loving your enemies, about temptation, about sin about being a part of his kingdom. We, we know many of those things intellectually, but is there not a difference between someone who knows something intellectually and someone who truly does it? In a couple days, I'm gonna go with a group of guys, and it's sort of been a tradition around here for about eight years, um, and it kept going even when I was gone, um, and, and now I'm, I'm thrilled to be back and do it again, but we go on a hike. We're going to go for six days and hike the Buckskin Gulch and the Priya Canyon. 
And uh, this is a group of guys that are going. They don't all know each other super well. It's always been that way. We don't all know each other. We've got about half that have gone before, half that haven't. And, and um, when you go and, and walk this canyon, it, it, the crazy part is on Wednesday, Wednesday night, about 9 or 10 o'clock when you're maybe settling in for bed or maybe you're watching the news, maybe you're watching Fallon, maybe it's something like that, maybe you're in third shift, you're getting ready to go to work. Some of you, you've already been asleep for two hours. But while you're doing that, we are going to be being, uh, this group of men is going to be dropped off by complete strangers in the middle of the wilderness in the pitch black of night. We're going to hike in about a mile, maybe two miles, set up camp, and then the next morning, we're going to wake up, and we're going to begin to hike this Buckskin Gulch, a slot canyon, and that will lead us to the Perea River. And as we make this hike, we will spend the next five days walking together. We won't have any cell phone signals. We will have no meetings. We will have no agendas. We will have no one telling us what to do. No, that part's, I don't mean that. But we will be totally separated from the chaos of the world around us. And as we walk, we will walk in the realms of a prayer, take a spiritual pilgrimage. We're literally walking out our prayers. And as we walk, we will talk, and we will either be talking to Jesus or we'll be talking to the guys who will become like brothers to us as we walk that path. That same morning, that same morning, there will be people waking up right around the trailhead where we go in, wire, uh, wire pass. There will also be people at the end of our journey called Lee's Ferry. And those people will be getting up in that morning. They'll have their cameras and they'll have their brochures. They'll have all the brochures they grabbed from the visitor center. They'll have pamphlets that tell them all about the Perea River Canyon. And, and they'll have pamphlets that tell them all about Buckskin Gulch. And, and many of them will, will go in on Wires Pass and, and they'll walk in maybe a mile or two, maybe spend an hour or two there. And they, they will take incredible photos. And they'll be able to document their trip and write stories and tell you what it was like to be in the Buckskin Gulch. And then they, then they leave. Then there'll be others on the other end, Lee's Ferry, and they'll go in with their cameras and their pamphlets and they'll have all the brochures and, and they'll be so well informed. They'll have done the Google search. They'll know all the information. And they'll get in there and they'll go to the place where, where Clint Eastwood shot a Western movie back in the day and they'll take their photos. And both of those people, which other end they come in on, they're going to say that they, that they went to the Priya Canyon. But like many who have walked before me and, and those of us who have lead, led men into that canyon will tell you, no, they haven't. There's a canyon philosophy that we have that simply says there are those who are tourists and there are those who are pilgrims. And there's a difference between the two. The tourist is very comfortable out on the edge and taking a glimpse at it and looking at it, and they know all the information because they've done the Google searches. They know all the right things to say. They know everything that would give the appearance. They've even taken the photos to look like they've gone to the Priya Canyon, but they didn't go into the Priya Canyon. The pilgrim goes on a journey. The pilgrim goes on a journey into that canyon, and, and they know what it is to, to feel the ice-cold water of the Priya on their feet. They know what it is to hear the simple sounds of a, of a crow flying through the canyon as that crow's noise echoes. They know what it is to see things that no tourist will ever see because they don't go on the journey. The tourist will never see the meanders that you go back into. They will never see the, the arch that's found tucked away off the path. They won't see the canyon walls like they were meant to be seen at an incredible height in such a narrow passage. Why? Because there's a difference between a tourist and a pilgrim. When it comes to being a disciple, there is only a pilgrim. There can't be a tourist. You see, the tourist in the spiritual element of what we're talking about is the one who has all that intellectual knowledge about what it, the Bible says about forgiveness, what the Bible says about sin, what the Bible says about loving one another, what the Bible says about loving your enemy. But the, the pilgrim who's willing to go on the journey, truly being a disciple and following Jesus, they're having to walk out the messiness of what it means to forgive someone who's hurting you so deeply. They're the one who's working through with the power of God helping them to love the person who they consider an enemy. 
They're the one who, who knows what it is to put your trust into God when the temptation seems so strong because they just don't have it up here. They're walking the journey. They're trusting him. They're living in the becoming. You can have the intellectual knowledge of leadership, discipleship, and evangelism. But we are inviting you to experience the journey as a follower of Jesus into those three thoughts and to see what God can do. See what God can do in our midst. So you have got this thought of true growth is both knowing and becoming. Now chances are, if you haven't fallen asleep on me, you've seen some of the tension. You can see it as we talk about it because there's this route of, yeah, we want to know more and more and more about Jesus. We want to know what it is to follow him. We want to know who God is, his character. We want to know those things. But at the same time, we want to become. We don't want to just have the head knowledge. We, we, we want to become a follower of Jesus. We want to live life as a disciple. We want to live in that realm. And so there is this tension. Now, most often, human nature, when we get stuck in tension, what do we do? We don't like it. And so we end up going into something like this where there's tension pulling two ways. We will go one or the other. Instead of living in the tension, it feels safer to go to one extreme or another. Don't believe me? Listen to people or watch their Facebook post about politics right now. We don't like talking the tension. So we go to extremes. In the extremes, in the, in the idea of true growth is both knowing and becoming. When you go to the extreme of knowing, but you're ignoring what it is to become and you're not willing to live in the tension, then you are very well informed. You've been to every Bible study, every class we could ever offer. You, you are so well informed, but you're not doing anything. I mean, often these are, are people who are willing to have hour-long debates about theology and doctrine. But they're totally missing the broken, hurting, and lost person that just walked by. Or they've passed them off to someone else. And before you get all lit up about that one and go, that's right, well, let me tell you about the other side. Because some people go to this extreme, and they want to say that they're on the side of becoming. They want to say, well, I'm becoming very much like Jesus. But often when you live in the extreme on this end and don't live in the tension, you're doing what the Bible refers to as works. You're trying to perform for Jesus. Trying to create some image and some look. And, and, and we get on this side and it's all that. And, and, and the, the problem with that is we'll call ourselves a follower of Jesus. But how well do you really know the Jesus you're following if you aren't taking the time to get to know his word and know who he really is. You see, we've got to live in the tension. We've got to be willing to go there. We've got to be willing to embrace it. True growth is both knowing and becoming. If you are willing to live in that tension, I do believe it'll help you make better decisions in your own spiritual walk. I believe it'll clarify to you what really matters. I believe it's going to give you a sense of perspective that Jesus would want you to have when you're willing to live in the tension of knowing and becoming. Jesus himself operated with this thought and mentality as he dealt with the disciples. I love how Reggie Joyner puts it. Reggie Joyner talks about Jesus didn't gather the disciples up on a mountainside, get a guitar out, sing Kumbaya, and then just give some inspirational speech. Now, Jesus would often invite the disciples into the tension. And he goes through a list, and I I think it's great, and let me just share a few of those with you where Jesus would make a point in the middle of the tension so that his disciples would learn what it was and is to follow him. He would party with tax collectors, corrupt people. He would party with the prostitutes. And in the middle of the tension of him doing that, he was teaching them, his disciples, to see people as God sees them, to not be prejudiced, to not judge Jesus would break sacred traditions, and in those moments would be times of great tension, and in that tension, Jesus would be teaching them. He would heal someone on a, on a day when he was not supposed to be doing anything, and he would teach them that, well, people are that valuable to Jesus, 
that they matter that much. It was intention that he would allow them to be out on a boat in a storm. And in the middle of that tension, he would teach them what it was to trust him and rely on him more than their fears. Jesus would even allow this angry mob to say whatever they wanted to say, and he would choose not to respond. In the middle of that tension, he was teaching his disciples that God's plan, God's mission was more important than their lives. And I really do believe that we see in the life of the disciples, Jesus' method was very effective. When they were forced to live in the tension that I believe all of us are to live in, of both knowing and becoming, Jesus would teach them, he would tell them things, but he would also put them into opportunities to live it out. And in those moments, in that tension, is where I think you can truly experience the presence of God more than you ever have before. When we're willing to live in the tension of knowing and becoming. No wonder that group was ready to go into a broken world with a message of love and grace and redemption. It's because of the way Jesus taught them, because they knew what it was to live in the tension. That tension will help you with your doubts. Living in that tension will help you realize who you are in Christ. That tension will help clarify what you believe in God. The tension is good. So let me ask you the tough question. Are you robbing yourself? Are you robbing yourself of the defining moments that exist in that tension because you're afraid to live in the tension? Where are you? I have no clue at this moment what or if God is saying anything to your heart, but I want you to know that the tension is where we want to help you grow. When we look to the future, like we said, these are foundational thoughts. We don't have we're not laying out right now plan A, B, and C, but what I can tell you is there are opportunities coming starting in 2017 that will be there to help you know and to help you become and what it is to live in that tension. There are opportunities coming that I believe are gonna help us be even more with a heart of passion, a follower of Jesus Christ that's fully devoted, that's living in that tension and embracing it. Will you embrace the tension? What if, what if after a series like this where we, we lay down foundational things and we say leadership, evangelism, discipleship, what if we truly were a people that lived in that tension? Can you imagine what God could do with that? What if, what if we were a place that was so passionately on fire for Jesus that we were seeing leaders developed, that we were seeing evangelism take place, that we were seeing disciples being made. What if we truly believe that the church is empowered by the Holy Spirit for leadership, for evangelism, for discipleship? What if we truly believe that? What, what if the front doors of our church were not those doors out there, but the front doors of this place we're our lives. And it's in our lives, as we're living it in the tension, that people experience the presence and encounter the presence of God. Because we are a group of people who love Jesus and just want to make an impact for the kingdom. What if? What if we embrace that? Would you stand with me? You know, these last few weeks have been um, probably a little overwhelming, probably very overwhelming. And I want you to understand that the, the, some of the words that Jesus would speak that I think apply to times where we feel overwhelmed by what we feel called to do is when Jesus said, listen, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you because it is light and it is easy. And, and when we feel overwhelmed, we need to be reminded the reason that we take that yoke on ourselves is that we walk with him. You're not alone. So if God is speaking to your heart right now about living in the tension and he's calling you to it, know that he's calling you, he's inviting you to join him. He's not sending you out without him, he's inviting you into a deeper sense of his presence. 
We've been singing a song uh, through this series. It's a song where it speaks about us crying out. It speaks about us desiring more and more, more knowledge, more becoming like him. Where, where this sense of we wanna be a place where it does echo through the nations because of what God is doing in our midst. But ultimately the song comes to the peak when it screams out, heaven fall down. And what that is, is a cry to God to say, God, would you overwhelm us with your presence? And not just in a gathering like this, but in our lives. So today, as we sing this song, maybe when you belt out those words, when you cry for heaven to fall down, when you cry for God's presence, maybe it's a moment where you are saying, God, I'm willing to live in the tension because that's where I believe I will encounter that very presence. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing. And I invite you to let that song be a response of your heart as we move forward as a church into some very incredible and exciting times. But may we go forward in the tension. May we go forward willing to be a pilgrim and no longer live life as a tourist when it comes to following Jesus.